I call this meeting to order. This is a regular meeting of the Northfield Public School Board. Today is Monday, January 8th, 2024, and the time is 6 p.m. This is a, this meeting is being live streamed and recorded. The recording of this meeting will be posted on the district website as soon as possible. Welcome members of the community here tonight to observe the important work being done on behalf of all school district stakeholders. Dr. Hillman, we have some items in the table file. Yes, we just have a few items uh, in the table file this evening. Uh, we have an appointment, uh, we have an increase in assignment, and we have a leave of absence. In addition, uh, we have the financial report uh, from September of 2023 as well in the consent agenda. So those are the items for tonight's table file. Okay, thank you very much. If there are no objections, we will add these items to the agenda as we move forward. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as presented? Moved by Jeff, second. Hi, right, Jenny, thank you. Any discussion on that item? Okay. All those in favor of approving the agenda as presented, say aye. Aye, opposed, motion passes. I need, do we have anybody for public comment? Okay, that was item three, public comment. And item four is announcements and recognitions. And we have none this evening. Very good, thank you. We're moving on to item five. Items for discussion and reports. Prairie, Prairie Creek Community School and Arcadia Charter School will present their annual reports. Welcome Simon Taylor, Director of Prairie Creek Community School. Hey, thank you. Uh, thank you and good evening. Yes, my name is Simon Taylor. I'm the Executive Director of Prairie Creek School. I believe this is my 13th year as director, so thank you for welcoming me back once again. I'd, I'd like to start with a, a couple of thank yous. Uh, firstly, to you, the Board of Northfield Public Schools, for continuing to authorize our charter school, uh, which you have done so since um, 2002. It's been a, a wonderful relationship. It's it's not a typical relationship anymore to have a school district uh, authorizing charter schools, and it's not something we take for granted. We talk for uh, often at Prairie Creek around uh, what a collaborative, uh, wonderful relationship this is uh, for our school. And we appreciate the work that Dr. Hillman and his team does to put that into place for us. Uh, Dr. Hillman uh, meets regularly with myself and uh, Laura, the director of Arcadia. We have quarterly check-ins. It's a great place for us to ask questions, to process things that are happening and use the expertise and knowledge that he brings along with Daryl Keller, who's uh, sitting back there, who's also supporting charter schools this year. And then just to be part of a community of educators where we can both share some of the innovations that I'll touch on a little bit tonight, um, but also have such a tremendous uh, wealth of resources to help us in our public school. So I, I thank you. And with that, um, I've just got a few slides tonight. I'll endeavor to be uh, brief, but leave room at the end for uh, any questions uh, you've got about our school. So it's always good to start with mission. Mission is central to what we do at Prairie Creek and really over the course of the school's existence, which dates back to uh, 1983, these four pillars have, have been in place. Some of the language, the vision language that sits underneath these pillars has shifted over time, but really these four um, central tenets of what we are uh, guide all we do. And as you know, uh, public education is, uh, there's lots of change, lots of policy initiatives that happen. What these four um, pillars do for us is sort of help us you know, steer a steady course on what we believe is uh, best for our students, best for our community. And we always try and bring it back to how are we doing as a community school, a child-centered school, a progressive education school, and one that works to make the world a better place. Uh, how does that mission look in action? Well, I would definitely don't have um, all the time tonight, and you have lots to do, I know, uh, to go into exactly what that looks like out at our school. 
having regular connection with Dr. Hillman gives a little insight, I think. And I, I didn't mention at the beginning that he also comes out and does a site visit day at our school and gets a little deeper dive into just what it looks like in action. Uh, I've got a slide here which just highlights some of the new initiatives on what has become a really integral part of what we do at our school, which is uh, outdoor learning. Um, Outdoor learning is not new to Prairie Creek. We're fortunate to have a building that's situated on some uh, beautiful acreage. I think what's changed in recent years is um, intentionality around how we use that space. We have a one day a week forest classroom focus, which we call a, a wild Wednesday on the late start day. Um, we've added in some really important residencies and connections with the local colleges. Um, there's a little uh, picture at the top of this slide, which is uh, one of the um, sort of nature signposts that were created around the grounds in collaboration with Carlton students as part of an arts residency, has pictures of, uh, of uh, plants, trees, some of the children's poetry, and these are now dotted around our school. Um, a couple of bullet points down, it speaks to what we do with St. Olaf. Uh, they have a, a vibrant environmental education program, and we've developed a partnership with our student environmental education committee. What that means is we have St. Olaf students come out. They helped us um, fund, build, vision for the hoop house that you see um, in one of those uh, photographs on the slide too. And now we're, we're designing some hoop house, um, prairie seed sort of foundational plants that we, we hope will end up in our, our grounds going forward. We're also working with St. Olaf on some grant initiatives. We've been researching solar, geothermal, um, support for a, a prairie project we're interested in. And I have a long-standing tradition for the schools to take our fifth graders up to Wolf Ridge. So it's not just about outdoor learning on the site we're on, but how we're getting children out on field trips and experiencing uh, environmental education in this beautiful state of ours. You're also here to know that we're functioning well as a public school in terms of our adherence to um, to a policy and practice and ensuring that students are learning in our school. One way that happens is through standardized assessment and uh, these check-ins. I show you just a summary of the data that's on our report card in more detail around the MCAs. So this is in comparison to state scores and also our own scores over the past uh, four, four years, excluding 2020 when we did not have MCAs that you see on the slide there. So uh, we continue to be strong in all the tested areas, uh, very steady success in reading. Um, pleasingly, we've seen a sort of rebounding in our math scores in the past couple of years as we've been able to get back into a more steady curricular focus in mathematics post-pandemic. Um, on the left of this slide is really an emphasis on the fact that the um, standardized assessment is really only one way we look at children by mission. It's a very skill-centered way, but we're really interested in the whole child in how we approach evaluation with children. So formative assessments, performance observation, the children do a lot of personal projects, research projects, and share their learning through broad science and social studies centered themes. Um, uh, we're looking to develop children who are both engaged, but also uh, reflective about their practice. So a, a big focus of our program is uh, non-traditional conferences, parent conferences. We have three conferences a year with families. Uh, two of those, the teachers write uh, written narratives about the child's progress and experience in the school and opportunities for growth. And that is shared and shared on conversation with both the student and the parents at those conferences. Um, an another aspect uh, that is important, I know, to the authorizer when you're thinking about the sustainability of our schools is uh, what's our financial management like? Um, how are we um, how are we attentive to that? How are we looking strategically? And what are any challenges? Um, we have a board-led uh, finance committee 
experts set strategic direction about financial management and includes community members, board members, staff in budgetary decisions. Um, our audit uh, was conducted by ABDO and we had a clean audit this year with no concerns. And we continue to have a strong fund balance policy. You, you see a slight dip there on the graph, which we expected. We, we do have a board fund balance policy, which says that three years out, we will have a minimum of 25% fund balance. And whilst meeting that policy at times can be challenging, uh, as, as you know, in uh, the sort of revenue expense world, um, all the public education is in right now. I, I think it's also that policy that's enabled us to uh, uh, weather some uh, complex years in, in public education funding and set us in a good place going forward. Uh, and we're really doing so almost five year forward planning now because we have to look at the long-term uh, challenges of uh, where revenue is going to sit versus the cost of, of running a public school. But we're, we're in a very strong position going into those conversations and that's helping our strategic focus. So I've shared a lot about what was happening last year, results from last year, um, what's going on this year in regard to our strategic plan. Um, we have a mission aligned strategic plan, which is developed in alignment with our charter school contract that we have with no field public schools. So the, the work around our strategic focus began in 2022 and we're sort of midway through that process. And then each year we collaborate with teachers, children, parents, board on particular focus for the year that's, that we're in. This year, a lot of that work centered on community connections. Um, we've been steadily building back to that place of wanting to engage with outside agencies, with educational experts, with parents, having more community events as, as we sort of uh, rebuilt confidence and security around doing that work post pandemic. So we, we set some goals around that, that this year. You can see on the slides that we've had some special persons, grandparents events. Um, the top slide is taken at a parent education evening where our educational psychologist, Michelle Flannery, presented on the topic of building independence of children. And, and we had breakout sessions with parents and teachers on smaller practices to build that agency in kids. Um, and then we're, we're also back to our art residency focus as well. And uh, we're actually right in the midst of uh, a residency with a St. Olaf uh, J term. We're creating an opera together. We're in day two of that. So uh, it does not look like an opera yet, but uh, the idea is in about, um, two weeks time, and I think it culminates actually, Dr. Hillman, on the day that you're scheduled for a site visit. So uh, we'll see what you see, you, you, you can let us know. Um, and then some of our constructs around building these community connections include our guided bird buddy program, which is really just a colloquial term we use at Prairie Creek for a multi-age construct where children from each developmental phase uh, are in small weekly um, structured activities together to build connection, empathy, support for each other, which um, supports our program throughout. A couple of the small strategic pieces that I think are really excited, we've been exciting. We've been looking at our teacher leadership initiatives. We have a very strong faculty at Prairie Creek with a lot of experience. So looking at how to build a more robust leadership team and then a teacher residency program. I think just like every school, every district, we've been thinking about how do we, we build our sort of grow your own program at Prairie Creek in our very small context. Uh, we've had success working with a St. Thomas Charter School initiative that supports uh, teachers, uh, prospective teachers get, um, getting their licensure through a master's program whilst in our school. And we currently have um, two uh, future teachers in that program, one in the general ed program and one in our special education program. Uh, and, and that's been a phenomenal program. We've, uh, we've been involved for two years now and, and hope to uh, continue that going forward. 
And that is my very rapid fire sort of 30,000 feet overview. Um, I'd like to open up a, a, a space for any questions you might have. Thank you, Simon. Stellar. Um, any questions from the board members? Questions or comments on the report? No? Okay, thank you so much, Simon. Oh, did you have one, Ben? Yeah, go ahead. I feel obligated, right, Simon? <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you so, too. This is a quick, I mean, the, the the assessments and we always talk about this when we were in Prairie Creek, we had small cell size and yeah. tests, but, you know, I think certainly encouraging results when you look at sort of the trajectory there. How is the science of reading act or kind of the read act that came out of this last legislative session how how might that show up in yeah the teaching in the curriculum yeah it's a really terrific question ben i think i'd sort of go back to the first thing you said that and i should have said this as a qualifier back on that slide we're a very small cell size so i sort of present that trend data with a note of caution that it can really oscillate wildly when you only have uh, 30 children testing at each grade um, that said, I, I think the read act, I, I, I know got, um, Hope Langston sitting behind me is an expert in this field, so I'm a little bit cautious to say too much about it. Hope jump in and correct me if I get anything wrong here. And Hope's actually been an uh, amazing resource for us as we've tried to work through the requirements of the new read act in our small context. Um, I, I think what I what I like about this moment is that there's a lot of attention on literacy and it's open up opening up some really important questions. There's an equity value to the Read Act. I think if it's supported financially, as it seems to be set out to do, it can equip schools with some new curriculum, uh, professional development where needed and and required, and uh, set schools to really identify pass more clearly than in the past what's happening at each tiered space. So in our small world, we we already had a tiered model of special education, some ADSIS intervention support, and then of course the classroom leveled intervention is brought forward conversation for us on how we communicating that progress with parents. And I think it's pressed us a little bit to open up areas of conversation in the fall, particularly with tier one kids. And then we will be back into those conversation and a progress approach at the upcoming January conferences. So as far as skills go and the science of read reading in terms of that foundational element, I think there's important equity work. It means children are not gonna uh, miss out on opportunities for intervention support where needed. Um, I, I think some of the challenges are, you know, timelines. Uh, we're excited to see what curriculum MDE is going to release. We're still waiting that. It seems like it seems uh, our assessment tool, FastBridge, we, we use for winter spring aligns with what the state is suggesting is a good tool. So we, we can sort of double down on that tool. It's already in place. And then the professional development piece is a little more complex for a small school to do that in a meaningful way. Um, at our professional development level in-house, um, I think Ben, so I'll circle back to the big picture of your question, is it's causing us to make sure that we're embracing this skill-centered piece of the READ Act, but not at the expense of other elements of literacy that just seems so important to me that we're at risk of maybe um, shifting our glance away from in terms of what it means for a child's education. So by that, I mean some of the uh, literacy across the curriculum. We're talking about where does literacy live in forest school? Where does it live in science? Where does it live in social studies, in math? Um, we're talking about deep reading and how do we protect a child's capacity to develop the brain pathways that support deep reading and print materials even though some of the read act science of reading pieces might suggest they lend themselves better to screens and devices. We also know that we have to sustain that capacity for children to think critically, imaginatively, build a connection with literature from the past. So I think these are really interesting things for all schools to wrestle with. How do we implement this pretty comprehensive new law, but also, do the workers, um, the justice said in his remarks at the beginning, I think something about um, 
educating a body of students that can think critically and I had to paraphrase him, I think participate in society. And that's good. That takes much more than just the science of reading and the skills of reading. So part, part of our mission is to play with that in our small setting. Thank you so much. Any other questions or comments? Thank you so much, Simon. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate your time. Thanks. We now welcome Laura Stelter, director of Arcadia Charter School, also presenting on um, her report for Arcadia Charter School. Welcome, Laura. Thank you. It's me to move forward here. All right. Break that down a little bit. Okay. Um, I'm Laura Stelter. I'm the executive director of Arcadia Charter School. This is my fifth year at Arcadia. Um, and I'm really excited to be presenting to all of you. Thank you for inviting us and authorizing us, which is huge support, um, especially as I've grown in this role over the last few years. I feel like this is my first year of being the director where COVID isn't what I do all day. And so it's been really helpful to have Matt and Simon to support me as I figure out what it really means to be a school director. Um, starting with our mission, so a couple of years ago, uh, the board was wondering if there was a way that we could better measure our progress toward our mission. And as a project-based school, we love rubrics. So we made our very own Arcadia rubric, and we created uh, this with all of the community involved. So um, parents, on the district advisory committee, parents who um, filled out a survey for us, students who either came to meetings or um, shared that information through surveys as well, um, helped us put together this rubric that we could use to measure our movement toward our mission and vision. And so it has four categories. Uh, we're striving to be a school that is progressive, that is equitable and inclusive, that is growth and transition focused, and that values project-based learning. And so within each of those four categories, then we created these indicators that would allow us to determine our movement toward those things. So on the slide here, I just included a little snippet of one of the categories. So this is from the equitable and inclusive category. And this is only three of the indicators. There are more indicators in this category, but this is just a small example. And then this is with the board's feedback. So the board, um, the B with the highlighted, that's where the board put us. And then uh, part that I didn't include, there's a place where we have to put in examples and demonstrate that we've met that thing. So it turns into kind of an interesting portfolio of what we've done and where we're going. Um, the current focus, we're really looking at the two categories of equitable and inclusive and project-based learning. And so we've done a lot of professional development that was really focused in those two areas, especially around restorative practices, uh, multilingualism and translanguaging and PBL 101. So that's project-based learning. We, all of the staff did project-based learning 101 in August of 2021. And then they have lifetime access to a lot of resources through PBL Works. And so we've continued using those resources through our QComp professional development program um, over the course of the last few years and continued to develop those skills. And in, in practice, what has happened is we have very few, almost zero disciplinary referrals we have a bilingual SEAL program that is doing really well. We have a number of students testing each year and we have a project in every class now. And so we've made some really um, great strides in these areas that we've chosen to focus on and toward our mission. Uh, MCA data in the same format as Simon's. Um, however, on the left, I just put sort of a summary uh, or interpretation a little bit of what we think we're seeing. Again, um, if you think small, their cell size is small with 30, we have like 12 to 18 students <laughs> taking this. So the numbers can vary greatly uh, with just one student. And it, in this case, for example, we know that three of our strongest math students opted out, even though we had over 95% participation and that had a pretty dramatic impact probably on our math score. It probably would have been a few percentage points higher, that sort of thing. Um, so we did, however, have over 95% participation. We are still really encouraging that because it does give us really good information just school-wide about 
where we should be looking, what our trends are. We continued to be above the state and local averages in reading and science, even though we were lower in math. We did pull out the juniors, and 68.8% of our juniors are proficient in math. And so we do believe that the interventions that we put in place actually at the end of FY22 have been really effective in supporting students as they progress in their math education. Um, and we did, we hired a one-on-one -on -one tutor, tutor, we changed around the schedule, we put more time into Algebra 2, we included a new, we expanded our intermediate algebra class to make sure students were ready for Algebra 2. So we made a number of changes to math to um, ensure that that growth was still continuing. I wanted to include some additional measures of student achievement because we have a lot of really cool things going on outside of our MCA scores. Um, I had the opportunity to talk to Daryl a little bit a couple of months ago about ways that he was measuring success at the ALC, and it was really an excellent conversation. So I've been thinking more about it, um, but this is some of the things that I had data for right now. So we do have a 100% graduation rate, six-year graduation rate. 100% of our seniors complete a senior project, which is um, in our world's best workforce goals, our college and career readiness goal is around that senior project. Um, and the expectation that all of our seniors will complete a senior project. Um, we had four bilingual SEALs this past um, year, two in Spanish, two in French. Two of those students um, had been in an EL program at one point and graduated from Arcadia fluent in both languages. 25.7 um, is our average ACT score. We had a couple of 36s last year as well. Um, students are attending a number of different institutions. We have students going a lot of different directions, um, post-secondary education, careers. Um, a lot of students are doing the uh, like DCTC or um, South Central and then transferring to a four-year institution pathway. Um, our consistent attendance rate is 71.5%, which is slightly above the state average. We're really working to keep improving that, but we were glad to see that it was at least a bit above the state average. And then again, we have almost no disciplinary referrals. So we we think that speaks to the sense of community that students feel there and their connection with their teachers and peers. Um, our ADM went way up in FY22. This was right post COVID. A lot of people were looking for a smaller school. Um, and so we had actually a, um, our actual enrollment was up to 130 at one point. And then um, this past year then in FY23, that dropped, but it was almost all in the middle school. So our sixth grade, we only had 10 students enter and 18 is the average size. So we had a completely overpacked high school with waiting lists in most grades and then a very small sixth grade. So and that seems to be a trend that has we we tend to have a small sixth grade and then expand in seventh. So that's something that we're kind of keeping an eye on. Our general fund balance and expenditures. Um, so our fund balance is up to 33.95%. A lot of that was COVID funding. And so that we are um, this year running a deficit budget and anticipate that will go down some. Um, our fund balance is over $700,000. I think it's 744 or something. And our um, policy is 400,000. So we're well above what we say we're going to have in our policy, but we do need to revise that to reflect we're looking for that 53 days cash on hand. Um, so that's sort of an overview of what's going on at Arcadia. Do you have any questions for me? Thank you, Laura, great report. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Ben. <laughs> oh, thank you, Laura. So coming out of this last session, were there any things, any kind of items that were oh, big opportunities or big challenges, you know, from the Arcadia perspective? Yeah. So um, the civics change, I think for us was fantastic. We were already doing civics across um, the high school years with quite a bit, uh, like we had electives in the junior and senior year. Um, civics has been kind of a big deal for us the last few years, starting in, um, let's see, this would have been FY21. Nope, FY22. We started with a nine-day opening civics expedition. And um, then this past year, 22-23, we had a four-day 
expedition, but the civics focus remained. So we reviewed that and then we kept that this year. So we keep expanding on their civics knowledge at the beginning of every year. That's part of the social contract process. That's a big um, kind of a central part of how we build community. Um, so some of those changes that I think are much more challenging in a system that is a little bit more set where you have a lot of moving parts, we were, we've been able to sort of negotiate things or we already had in place things that made it not as challenging for us. Um, I think we've had, we have a wonderful FIAD teacher who's just started. So covering those standards, not a problem. Uh, we also have teachers who are participating in the St. Thomas residency program. Um, so, you know, in terms of meeting our obligations, having the staff, like we're, we're doing pretty well. Um, we are, the curriculum committee is looking at our schedule long-term as we add more requirements. Um, earth science has been a bit of a challenge figuring out because we did not have a ninth grade earth science. And now uh, this will be the first year that it is like the whole year is a full credit of earth science standards. So earth and space. So, yeah. Yep. Any other comments or questions? Jenny. Thank you, Laura. Uh, first of all, congratulations on your almost zero disciplinary referrals um, and also on the very strong ACT scores. Um, I just have a couple of questions. Um, first, as you mentioned, a, an advisory committee. Yeah. Um, is that your only um, committee that you have that involves uh, parents and, and or students or do you have other committees? No, actually, all of our committees invite um, parents and students. So we have parents on most of our committees, and we try to get students on most of our committees. A lot of them are busy and are not super excited about being <laughs> on the committee. But we do try to always gather student input, either by we have the way that our kitty is structured, we have four advisories. And so all of the students are in one of those. And it's just a group of students together with two adults who meet at the beginning and end of every day. And so when we're working on something and we want to know, like right now we're looking at our grading practices and assessment. And um, we've talked about homework and we want students input on um, what feedback is important to them. What do they listen to? What helps them grow? Where, you know, how much homework um, is reasonable and what kind of homework do they appreciate? And that, so we, we try to gather that information. It is a little bit easier because with only a hundred, right now we're at 103 for our enrollment. It's a lot easier to ask 103 people, what do you think? What do you want? What do you need? And, and respond to that really, um, pretty agilely, um, than it would be with a much larger group, but we have this sort of built-in opportunity every day to talk to students. And so I think that helps. Yeah. Excellent. Um, and then what, what would your average class size be for this year? Or do you combine certain courses together? So all of our classes are pretty much one section because of the size of the school. And so um, an average class size is 18 if, if it's full, but right now we have 10 sixth graders. So the sixth graders have classes of 10 for all of their grade level classes. And then we do have some mixed grade classes. Um, it, at the middle school level, they have a mixed project work time where they're all um, working on projects they can collaborate. Um, so they did like uh, service projects, for example. And so a bunch of them worked on tie blankets together for Operation Joy or um, they did a rivers project. And so the sixth and the eighth grade did a whole bunch of work with um, community organizations, speakers, people who taught them a lot about the watershed in the area. And then they each did their own, they had their own question that they then explored, but they had all of these peers that they could work with, so. Great, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would like to just make a few comments about both school reports. Uh, first of all, thank you, my friends, Simon and Laura, for great presentations. You know, Minnesota was the first state in the U.S. to pass the charter school law way back in the 1990s. And the two schools that we authorize and have so for over 20 years, or at least 20 years 20, for our because they sell, I was at the celebration this summer, 
these two schools, you hear a lot about the charter school uh, discussion nationally. And we always have to be careful about taking that national narrative and painting our local context. But these two schools really embody exactly what the Minnesota charter school law intended uh, to create a flexible school situation that people could have choice within a public school construct to attend. And so we are proud to only be one of only two traditional public schools in the entire state that still authorize charter schools. It's a rigorous process. Our two directors know that because I'm bothering them during our authorization recertification process. And it is really just a wonderful partnership, one of our six strategic commitments to partnerships. And this is an excellent partnership. Um, the vast majority, I think it's fair for me to say, the vast majority of students at Arcadia or, or um, Prairie Creek at some point cross paths with the traditional Northfield public schools. And so we are really all in this together. Uh, the quarterly meetings were something to formalize the discussions that we had had before. But I think we could be really proud of having these project-based focused schools um, that provide parents that option should they uh, choose to use it. And so we're really proud of the work that they've done. And I do wanna just point out Daryl Keller, wave Daryl, there's Daryl. So many of you know Daryl from as uh, the director of our area learning center. Uh, Daryl has also done a number of other things for us over the years. So he is our targeted services coordinator, does a number of other things. When we were running our own online program, Daryl was the administrator in charge of our online program. And then this year uh, he is assisting me by taking the bulk of the real charter school, the administrative responsibilities. So just want to thank Daryl for his work and, and for supporting folks. And then I just know at this table and for people watching, when you think about fund balance, uh, we can't, we got to talk about fund balance, right? Because our goal as a traditional public school district with almost 4,000 students is a 14% fund balance goal. And people say, well, geez, you know, Simon's got 41% and uh, Laura has 34%. And when you, the smaller the school that you get, it is important to have a larger fund balance because every student, if, if there are fewer students than anticipated, just a couple of those can really make or break your entire budget. So I just think it's important for people to hear. And I'm really proud. I specifically want to call it Arcadia because uh, there were some concerns about fund balance a few years ago and Laura and the board there, remember the boards at charter schools are made up of parents and teachers uh, as well as Laura and the hard work that they did to get that uh, fund balance back on trajectory because it's really essential that they have that um, security blanket, if you will, should they see a change in enrollment. So just, I thought this is a great opportunity to share with the board um, the work that the district does as an authorizer. And the great news is that because we have really competent directors and excellent boards at both, um, our responsibility is not daunting. So we thank you for your work in allowing us to be part of your educational communities. Thank you. Thank you to you both. Okay, we're on to item B, policy committee recommendation. Dr. Hillman will present the policy committee's recommended updates to policy 906. And this will be an item for individual action at the next board meeting. Uh, this is uh, policy 906. This is community notification of predatory offenders. Uh, not a ton of changes here. There were a few statutory reference changes. Uh, and then, in addition, there were a few minor modifications that the policy committee recommended just for clarity purposes. So, as you can see in the strike through underlying document, very few changes. So much of this policy is really driven by statute. So, we were just making the statutory uh, reference changes that MSBA had recommended, as well as just a couple of places to really just clarify responsibility. So, not many changes, but there was enough that we felt we should bring it uh, before you. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments on this item? Okay, thank you for that update. Item C, request to hire additional English learner instructional support. There are details outlined in the memorandum to tonight's agenda. This request will be an item for individual action at the January 22nd at board meeting. Welcome, Hope Langston. Good evening, how are you guys tonight? Uh, we're back. And um, as you know, the numbers continue to fluctuate. Uh, we're gonna, I'm not even gonna say anything tonight because I'll jinx it. But um, since we last met when we came with, uh, with the request that you, the board did support, and uh, we thank you for that, for an additional ELEA at the middle school and support at St. Dominic's for two new ES, EL students there. Um, 
since that time, we had some additional enrollment and another building um, with some support needs that were immediate. And um, when we were able and fortunate to, to hire a um, NELEA, we immediately shifted that person to this immediate need in another building, um, leaving the middle school still with 36 students and a temporary solution, which is working right now, but will come to an end on January 18th. Um, so I'm back again tonight um, where Ellen is still sitting at 36 students by herself with one EA um, support person, uh, and they're doing a great job. But the fact of the matter is that 36% of those students that she's serving are either rail or level one students who require per our language instructional educational plan, more minutes of service that we um, need to fulfill. So I'm coming back to you tonight um, to consider a request to fill that position at the middle school, um, knowing that we were fortunate to find someone who is supporting some recently arrived English learners in another building, um, but we still have this middle school need. Thank you, Hope. And just to clarify, we're not asking for your approval tonight. We're in a position where we have a temporary solution for another week. Mm -hmm. um, that posting is still open okay. uh, from the previous one. So that's a pool that we're able to use but we're going to ask for your approval at the next meeting. This is not something we're really trying to be uh, to make sure that you have an opportunity for changes to the budget over a two meeting period. And so we don't need approval tonight, but we're just making sure that you're aware of it. We will ask for approval at the January 22nd meeting. And then because the posting was still open, we should be able to move uh, fairly quickly if we are able to get some people to apply for the position. Exactly. Thank you for that. Any questions or comments for Hope? Jenny. Thank you, Hope. Yep. I just have a, one question. So there's 36 students total, EL students at the middle school. Mm -hmm. Are those um, distributed kind of evenly throughout sixth, seventh, and eighth, or are they mainly all kind of in one of the grades? If I can grab my computer, I can tell you exactly what that is. Hold on. We do keep a live dashboard. Um, that's updated anytime that there is a change um, to our EL population. It helps us know exactly what our needs are um, by grade level, just like what you are asking, which is great. Okay, so currently, as of today at the middle school, the grade distribution is actually higher in sixth and seventh grade. Um, eighth grade is lower for them this year, okay. which is the con the opposite of last year. Fairly evenly distributed. The rails actually are the recently arrived English learners are distributed across all three grade levels. Um, but the overall EL population for sixth and seventh grade is higher than eighth grade. But the rails are evenly distributed as are the level ones. And that is what makes this particularly challenging for her to serve the kids because, um, because of scheduling. So she can't, she can't easily put cluster them in one single class. Right. That's, that's exactly what I was kind of yeah. getting at. So thank you for that information. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Hope. All right. Item D is a, our potential 2024 Northfield High School bond referendum update. Dr. Hillman will um, review what has taken place thus far regarding the potential 24 referendum to address high school problems. So just uh, uh, bringing us back and um, activating prior knowledge, as we would say, we had a little bit of a break. So come back to help us in the public remind where we're at. Back in October, we started this uh, discussion about uh, looking to identify problems to solve in the high school facility. Uh, we started that discussion. Uh, we also at that time approved a randomized stratified uh, voter, stratified sample voter survey. As you know, we've had a couple of work sessions. We've discussed these problems uh, that we're trying to consider addressing 
uh, potentially with a bond referendum in November 2024 at this board table. Uh, what we've got right now is actually today uh, the randomized stratified sample survey of 400 district residents of uh, telephone survey began, and they expect that that will take uh, five to 10 days. Uh, just want to thank uh, Ben Miller and Jenny Nelson and Claudia Gonzalez George, who helped uh, just really polish the final version of that survey. Just appreciate those board members' uh, assistance in that process. We think we have a very good survey tool that's going to provide you with some quality information to be able to help make some decisions on next steps. You will notice that we did add a work session. You know that with this, we've got a work session a week from tomorrow. At that work session uh, at the high school media center, uh, Sal Bagley from World Architects and Engineers and um, us representatives from Knudsen Construction will also be there. Board members have asked for some beginning pricing on what some of the potential options to address uh, these problems would be, and uh, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be ready to share some of those initial estimates of potential options to solve those pieces, as board members has, had asked at the last work session. That's the beginning of it, just uh, sharing that part, and we'll continue to discuss uh, that process uh, next Tuesday. We had also made some other adjustments to the schedule, pointing out that on January 29th, we'll have a public meeting, again, in this effort to give you as much feedback as you have or can get before uh, we vote on what potential pathway we take. Uh, that will be run similarly to how we ran our budget prioritization process meeting. So just so board members have an idea of what that night will look like, January 29th will start in the high school auditorium uh, at 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, we are going to offer child care by registration. So for our district families, we'll ask them to sign up if they would like to be able to have child care. We just need to be able to know how many students are coming. We need to know the ages so that our ventures program who is going to uh, run uh, that child care can have age appropriate uh, materials and activities for those students. So we'll be getting that out as we uh, continue to uh, promote this in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and then we'll have a short presentation uh, about where we've been, the problems that you've identified to solve, some of the potential options uh, that we're considering. Uh, and then after that, folks will be distributed to up to seven classrooms. So a board member and an administrator would be in one of the seven classrooms. If there are fewer than 104, if we can get 140 people there, I'd be thrilled. But if we have fewer than that, we'll do some combination of rooms. We'll use the nominal process so that everyone who attends has an opportunity to share directly with one board member and one administrator and the other people in the room, what they think about the dilemmas that we're facing and how they might suggest that you proceed. We will come back then to the larger auditorium People will have the opportunity for the public comment style uh, approach. So district stakeholders, uh, just like our regular public comment, they'll have two minutes as opposed to three um, to be able to share in front of the entire group uh, who is there, what they feel and how they feel we should proceed. And then at the end, board members will have an opportunity to debrief uh, just what you've heard, things that you're thinking about, questions that you might have for administration to continue to give you information, and then we'll close that up. So as you think about it, uh, people have had, um, they can, of course, always have the opportunity to share directly with you what their feelings are. They have an opportunity, um, 400 residents will have their opportunity to share their feedback through that survey process. And then we have this public open meeting to be able to have people come in and share their uh, analysis of what where we should be going with you. Uh, the other change I want to point out is that we did push back the target date uh, for the board decision from February 26th to March 11th. A uh, couple of reasons for that. We have one board member who we know will not be able to be here um, on the February 26th board meeting. We want the full board here. Secondly, that is the date where the Morris Leatherman Company will be able to come and present uh, the results from the randomized stratified sample voter survey to you. So you will get that on February 26th. And then uh, there is, we had made a, we had made a modification as well about the work session that had originally been scheduled for February 20th when we thought we would already have those survey results. We think it's important for you to have those survey results before we have that work session. The issue that we just realized with March 5th, which was what we had initially set it for, we could still hold this on March 5th. There are a number of dates every year that we are restricted from having meetings, and there's a variety of different levels of meeting restrictions. This year being a presidential election year, I had missed that that is the presidential primary evening. We can still have a meeting, but it has to be done before six o'clock. So you can go, we could have a work session for, from four to six that day, or 
at 801 till 1001 or you know pm if you wanted to do it afterwards I'm not asking for people to do their uh, calendar right here but tomorrow you'll get a, an email from anita or i just asking would the fifth on from four to six p.m. work for people? If not, we will find a different date for that work session. I apologize, we we just missed that part. It's not one of the annual uh, dates that we look for, but we made an error. So when we make an error, we correct it. So this is the pathway through March eleventh. Uh, we continue to try to make sure that uh, we have tours. We have two more tours that are coming up: one on January twentieth, one on February third. Those are on Saturday, ten a.m. to noon at the high school. Uh, we may fit one more tour in pushing out the date of decision to March 11th. We would have the capacity and the time frame. We're thinking about, we'll see how many people we get in the next couple of tours. By the end of this, people would have had an opportunity for four different dates for tours. They could have attended the free bus trip to the Oatana uh, High School. Uh, we know people are engaged because we've seen them at, your, at the work sessions. We've had people in attendance at the work sessions. We have the scientific survey that's going to give you feedback. We have a public meeting that's going to give you feedback. Uh, you have had an opportunity to really dive in and uh, as a board decide what are the problems that you're trying to solve. We are starting to get into what are the potential pathways to solve those problems. And so when we get to this point on March 11th, really our hope is that everyone in the community will have had, that the reasonable person would say that everyone in the community who has wanted to have an opportunity to weigh in about what direction we go to do so by that point. So this is just reactivating uh, where we're at and getting back on track with this in our work session uh, next Tuesday. So I'd be happy to stand for any comments or if there are things that you specifically wanna make sure we're prepared to answer or talk about next Tuesday, I think we have a pretty good idea, but if anything that's come up, we can certainly uh, prepare that for you as well. And thank you so much for that update. And the timeline is in the packet and the packet is published on our district website as a, that's the typical process. Are there any questions about this item, Jenny? Thank you, Dr. Herman. Um, I just have a question regarding the public meeting for feedback. I know that you had sent out uh, some reminders and information to parents and district updates. And then also on our website, there's information about the date and place and time and everything. But have you, so the information that you just shared kind of about the agenda of that night um, and some of the details, uh, have you shared any of that information yet so that people who are planning to attend can maybe uh, uh, prepare um, with questions and things like that? Yes, we have not gone to that level of detail in our communication to this point. That is the kind of thing that we will continue to outline for people in our coming communications. Our first pieces were save the date, right? So that people have it on their calendar. Uh, we just saw the mock-up today of a postcard that we're intending to uh, distribute to every district resident so that not only you're getting social media, email, radio, tele uh, not television, no, thankfully we don't have tele uh, um, newspaper, but also we have a, a postcard that's going to go to all district residents with the final two tour dates and this public meeting on it as well. And we'll create a section of the website where we could link to where people can see what the agenda will look like. So we just haven't communicated that level of detail yet, but we certainly will as we move ahead. Okay, that would be great. Thank you. I just wanted people to be able to be prepared. Great. Yes, we want people to come with their opinions. Hey, Ben. Dr. Hamlin, can you just remind us, that if that's exciting to hear the phone survey is starting today, but can you remind us just briefly what the methodology for that is? Yeah, so they will use a combination of, um, in terms of tell me the, what are you asking for with the methodology specifically? Um, I think both remind us sample size and then just sort of okay. what, what steps they go through to try to reach people mm -hmm. to get that feedback. You got it. So uh, it is a 400 uh, resident survey. 400 residents will be surveyed. Uh, it'll take five to 10 days. The margin of error is plus or minus 4.8%. They will call, we, we, as you may have seen, uh, what we've shared both through media and through our website and through parent communications, we've explained to people what the caller ID will look like and what, what is the caller ID uh, name and what is the area code that it's coming from so that people will uh, answer. They will leave a, a message for people and they will continue to try to call them. Uh, they will go until they get 400 residents to have completed the survey, and that matches um, many of the demographics of the school district. So when you see the report, you'll see that it, down to the ward, right? Where did the 
what ward in the city or what different parts of the district did uh, folks um, participate from. So that's the methodology and they will just keep calling until they hit that particular demographic sample. Thank you. Anyone else comment or question? No? Okay, thanks for that update. All right, item six is our consent agenda. As a reminder, there were some personnel items in the table file added to the consent grouping. Is there anything anyone would like to pull from the consent grouping for separate consideration? Okay, is there a motion to approve the consent grouping? Moved by Jenny, second. By Ben, thank you. All those in favor of approving the consent grouping say aye. Aye, opposed, motion passes. Item seven, we have two items for action. First, we have several policy recommendations. I'll take a motion first and then we can discuss. Is there a motion to approve the recommended updates to policies 203, 441, 507, 902, and 903? Okay, move by Corey. Second. Okay, Ben, thank you. Dr. Hillman, do you have any comments? Um, I have no comments other than what I shared at, um, at the last meeting, and we'd certainly be willing to stand for any questions that people might have. Very good. Is there any dis discussion on these policies, questions, or comments? Okay, seeing no discussion, then we will we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion passes. Next, we have the pay equity report. Pay equity report um, state statute requires the district to complete a pay equity study and pay equity report every three years. Northfield Public School Board of Education last approved a pay equity report in January 2021. The memorandum from Director of Human Resources Molly Wieselman is included in the board packet. Is there a motion to approve the submission of the January 2024 pay equity report to the Minnesota Department of Management and Budget by January 31, 2024? Moved by Corey. Second. No. Thank you. Um, are there any comments or questions on this item? Molly is coming. She's just a couple okay. of moments away if people did have questions. Okay. We'll wait for Molly then. And if, I, I can certainly try to help with questions um, in the interim. Um, so if people do have questions about the pay equity report, I can do the best that I can, and then we can have Molly clarify uh, when she arrives. Will she have a little presentation or no? Uh, she can certainly go through the memorandum that she shared with mm -hmm. you, um, but I could certainly answer any questions to the best of my ability that people have, or potentially we might I might be able to do the enrollment report. If that is something that's acceptable, I could share the enrollment report and then we could come back to this. Okay, that sounds fair. Um, the enrollment report for January 2024. I'll plug in here so Tim can. Mm -hmm. So what you're gonna see with the enrollment report is that we are actually up another seven students uh, for the January 2nd report over what was previously reported. So uh, at the bottom of that report, you'll see that we are showing the um, whether we are above or uh, behind the projections that we had made for our uh, enrollment. And so what you'll see is that it's a few students here and there. So there's a few less at the high school, but there's four more at the middle school. Uh, there's a, just one more at Bridgewater, or a couple more at Spring Creek. And so you see how that adds the additional seven uh, students that we had over uh, December. And so this is good, um, seeing that maintaining that above projection, especially now that above 20, that's a very good place to be. Uh, at the next meeting in January, Val will be sharing the financial forecast, which will also include our next enrollment projections. Heard a few things from people, it's great that your enrollment is up, but remember this is the year that we had projected for quite some time where we would be stable or slightly above. Uh, and then the issue there is that, um, 
we still are projecting some declining enrollment again starting next year is the next uh, time where we'll start to see uh, some of that enrollment decline. So uh, I'd be happy to answer any of the questions about the enrollment report as well. Any questions or comments on the enrollment report? Okay, very good. Yep, I, I see Molly, if you wanna step up, we'll, we're ready for you. So just as a reminder, we have a motion and a second to approve the report. Um, and then Molly will share a little bit about the pay equity process, which we just do every couple of years. Every three years yes. to be exact. So yes, I'm gonna share some fun facts about pay equity. Um, just for informational purposes, you have the information that was sent out in the board packet. Um, so pay equity addresses um, gender bias in pay. Um, and we there's a state law that was passed in the early 80s that requires um, employers to use gender neutral criteria in um, how they um, set their wages. And so, and then the state requires us to have a process. Um, we have to choose a method um, of how we band and grade all of our positions in the district. And the district uses the decision band method um, to do that. And um, that takes all of our job descriptions and it puts it through the same process um, where the duties, the responsibility, the decision-making, um, all that is taken into account and then the position is put in a band and then there's a, a grade and a subgrade that goes with that, um, that determines the um, point value for that position. And then um, through the pay equity process, we have to pass um, three, three different tests. Um, and in 2021, when we filed um, our report, we did not pass the one test. Um, and then we um, made, some of you will remember that we made some compression to the salary schedule for the teacher agreement. Um, and that did help us then um, pass that test. Um, the, the statistical analysis test um, compares a salary data to determine um, whether female classes are paid consistently, um, made sure they're not paid consistently below male dominated positions um, that are similar in job points. Um, the salary range test compares the average number of years it takes um, to get from the base salary, entrance salary to the max salary. Um, and then the ex um, exceptional service pay test um, compares how often individual um, individuals in male classes receive longevity pay um, um, that is above the normal pay that a female dominated class would would um, have. Um, so that are the, those are the three tests that we have to pass um, or we have to do some major work um, on our our job descriptions and our, our pay scales and different things like that. We are passing all three of those tests. Um, this year after that compression in the salary schedule and a couple other things that were done in 2021, um, we are above the passing score on all three tests um, this time around. And then we would file again in 2027. Thank you, Molly, and thanks for your, um, your memo in the packet. Any questions or comments from the board members? Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Vote on that yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a motion. Um, all those in favor of approving the submission of the January 2024 pay equity report to the Minnesota Department of Management and budget by January 31st, 2024, say aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion passes. Item eight, we did our enrollment report and now we're moving on to um, items for information. Item B, public meeting. The school board will host a public meeting on Monday, January 29th. 2024 at the Northfield High School. The purpose is to solicit feedback from the public about the potential options to address the facility problems at Northfield High School. Item nine is our future meetings, work session and public meeting. So we have a work session Tuesday, January 16th, 5.30 in the high school media center. A regular meeting Monday, January 22nd, 6 p.m. in this boardroom. Public meeting Monday, January 29th, 6 p.m. in the high school um, auditorium. 
And then a regular meeting, Monday, February 12th, 6 p.m. in this boardroom. And we have a closed meeting, Monday, February 12th, immediately following the regular board meeting for the purpose of labor negotiations. That is all the business that we have tonight. Is there a motion to adjourn? I okay, move by Jeff. Second. Second. Final. Thank you. All those in favor of adjourning, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion carries. We are adjourned.